Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Sonia Visser, um, sales manager at Hypothesis, and we are so excited to uh, be partnering with JSTOR. So our session today is with Alex Humphreys, uh, who is the vice president of innovation at Ithaca. Uh, he is joined today with um, Lee Heisel. She is the Associate Teaching Professor of Communication at University of Missouri, St. Louis. And along with her is Dana Austin Cooper, who's a graduate student Hello. of Houston at the University of, Saint, of, of Missouri at St. Louis. So um, we are so excited to hear your presentation. One housekeeping note along the way, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put those in chat and Q&A and um, we will go ahead and get started. Alex, take it away. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you so much for uh, for being here. Um, I'm have a, we have a very quick sort of presentation to give you some background and basics that might be helpful uh, so that when we get to the meat of the matter, the real important stuff, the conversation with Lee and Dana, uh, you have all the information you need. So let's uh, dive right in. Uh, we're going to I'll give you a little bit of background information about JSTOR and uh, its integration with hypo hypothesis, its use in a classroom. Uh, and that's basically where we're, we're going to go. Um, so first, just some very bare bones things. I suspect most of you are familiar with Hypothesis. Um, I work for JSTOR. JSTOR is a part of a not-for-profit called Ithaca, whose mission is to expand access to knowledge and education around the world. It does throw through, through a variety of different services. JSTOR is probably its, mo its uh, largest, most impactful one. And that is a giant digital library that is licensed to uh, institutions and uh, providing access to on, the, on those campuses to millions and millions of scholarly articles and books and other primary sources. Because it's licensed through the library, very often the uh, it's not it's thought of as a library resource and not necessarily as an educational resource. But as you can see from these little um, uh, this, the, the patterns of usage that we see, it is very much an educational resource. All of our the, at least half of our usage comes with the cycles of the academic period. Some of that is research, you know, conducted for, by students writing papers, but a lot of it is materials in courses. So the JSTOR materials being included in syllabi. And that's a wonderful thing to be able to do because it's be, be, because it's institutionally licensed. Students do not have to pay extra to be able to have that access um, and to have those course materials. And course materials can get very expensive, as we all know. Um, one of the challenges, the reason why uh, we started working with Hypothesis was as we looked at that, those teachers doing that, we found some hurdles and barriers that uh, they commonly met when they were sharing JSTOR materials in classes. So they would include a link, for example, on the LMS and the syllabus, but because institutions have to, uh, library materials require authentication, uh, sometimes the student would get lost trying to get into and re-authenticate into the library, and that could add friction. That's one more reason why a student might not complete their reading, and that can be frustrating. Another challenge is that, um, if the to, to overcome that, the teacher might upload the PDF, download it from JSTOR and upload it into the LMS. That's great. The student gets gets immediate access. But what that means is that the publishers and authors and librarians don't see that usage and so don't know that it's really valuable and that they should continue to license and, and have access to that uh, material. And then, of course, last, it's uh, we all know the challenges, and we'll talk a little bit, a lot more about this later, that students can have encountering academic literature, which can be jargon-filled and daunting. Um, so uh, this integration uh, of JSTOR and Hypothesis is now available at every institution that licenses both Hypo Hypothesis and JSTOR. Um, so that's probably most of you if you license Hypothesis. Um, oh, I don't know why that that moved, but wasn't that fancy. Um, okay, so let me show you what it looks like uh, really quickly in case you haven't encountered it yet. Um, uh, when you're searching on JSTOR, you'll see uh, materials. When you find a, a article or a chapter that you want to have in your course, you take the, uh, the, the link, the stable URL that points to that article or chapter or material. Uh, and then in your learning management system, when you've selected an assignment and selected an external tool, 
this is what ha what you see after you select hypothesis. Uh, and once you're within that uh, environment, you select that you can choose uh, you can choose to uh, add a JSTOR uh, or material from JSTOR. When you do that, all you have to do is paste in the link that you just copied. Uh, and what it does on the back end is it checks to make sure that your institution has access to that uh, that ch chapter or um, article. And if it does, says go ahead, reminds you of JSTOR's terms and conditions, and you can uh, plug it in and get annotating with your class. Uh, this is what that uh, experience looks like. Um, we'll talk about all the reasons and the benefits of this shortly at the scaffolding it provides, the helping students develop reading strategies for challenging literature. I, I'd rather you hear from Lee and Dana about that than me, because uh, they're gonna, they're actually doing it. So uh, um, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. I do wanna flag that there are resources available if you're interested in using this. There are, um, there's a user guide for Hypothesis with JSTOR. Um, we'll put the link to this uh, slide deck in the, uh, chats, so you can get to these materials. And there's also sample assignments that faculty have used. Okay. With that, uh, I think we're ready, unless there are any questions that have come up in the chat, um, we're ready to turn to Lee and Dana and hear about their experiences. Um, anything in the chat? I'm going to stop sharing no, so that- Nothing in the chat, Alex, you can go ahead. We can dive right in. Excellent, Lee and Dana, thank you so much for being here. What, I, I know that Sonia introduced you very quickly, but I'd love to hear in your own words uh, 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 who you are and, your, and, your, and, and uh, introduce yourself for, for folks. Mm -hmm. So I'm Lee Heisel and I am an associate teaching professor at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. Um, I've been here for almost 24 years um, and teaching is, has been my, my career. Um, and, um, and Dana is one of my students. Hello, I'm Dana Austin Cooper. I'm a graduate student at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, um, pursuing a master's in communication. Well, that sounds great. So tell us about the class that, uh, that you were a student in, uh, and, and I'd love to hear Lee, how you used hypothesis in that class. Sure. Sure. Um, well, the course that I'm teaching is disability and communication. It's called diverse communication and disability. And it is a, it's considered a special topics course here at UMSL. Um, and so it's cross-listed with the undergraduate as well as the graduate students. And so, um, in that course, what we do is we talk a lot about interactions with individuals with disabilities. So the students learn about, stu about individuals and the different disabilities um, that they have may have and um, and then how to um, adjust their communication patterns in a way that meets the needs of that individual so they learn what we typically associate as being the typical or the expected communication patterns mm -hmm. and then we compare it to what how those differences might occur within those um, conversations um, because the course is so unique we don't have a textbook um, and so I do lean on research um, to provide the the readings to go along with the materials and so JSTOR has always been one of my favorite resources uh, to use and so um, whenever the um, opportunity to directly link the hypothesis app to the articles um, became available, I was very excited because it really cut down on a number of steps that I needed to go to or go through in order to link those articles. Um, it became much more seamless. So I didn't have to go look for the article, download the article, make it into a PDF, upload the article, and then... Um, Pre present it to my students for them to uh, comments to. Now it's just literally a two-click process and it's done. So um, I have I have found it to be very, very rewarding and it's saving me some time. Uh, that that sounds really useful. <laughs> and I want to come back to that and uh, and else. How um, how do you use hypothesis in the class? So when I present the articles, so um, as our readings, our weekly readings, um, the students then 
annotate them. And so because I have undergraduates and graduate students in the class, they're, they're coming from with different mm -hmm. skill sets and um, exposure to uh, academic articles. So the, the students approach it in different ways. It allows me to um, find things within the articles that are attractive to the students that are prompting questions um, and is providing me many perspectives so that I can say, okay, the students in this class are really seem to be interested in this area. So we're going to spend more time here or um, this, this it doesn't seem to be as much of an issue. They seem to have an understanding of this. So let's go spend mm -hmm. more time over here in this area. So with the graduate students and the undergraduate students working together, the graduate students really help the undergraduate students in navigating um, the readings. And um, they provide uh, an excellent, excellent mentoring um, for those undergraduate students. So whenever they get hung up on an area, the graduate students really have been great about stepping in and being able to to pull the undergraduates along and help them navigate um, some of the more complex readings. So Dana, you're one of those graduate students. I'd love to hear about your experience. Did you know you were doing this? And, like, oh, yeah. and I'd love to hear about your experience of a student in the class and using hypothesis and interacting with both undergrads and, and, and graduate students mm -hmm. alike. Well, it's just the classes have been a great experience. So I've learned a lot about uh, disabilities, uh, visible and invisible which mm -hmm. I had not heard of invisible disabilities prior to this class. And also all of the information is very um, practical. It's information that I can take and I can use and apply in my lived experiences in life. Yeah. Um, I have to be honest, when I first saw that there was a new tool that I had to learn, I saw this hypothesis, I thought, oh no, <laughs> not something new that I have to learn, including the course syllabus and the course material. But, yeah. but it's been great. It's been great. I like that it is a one-stop shop for the student where you've got your article there and then you can highlight as much as needed or as little. Mm -hmm. And you have your notations where you can actually highlight um, a paragraph or a sentence and then you can um, reply to it or expand on it with your annotations. So that mm -hmm. being right there on one screen, one page, mm -hmm. makes it very um, efficient. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more, Dana, like I, about interactions that you've had. Like you may, maybe you have an example of interactions with other students or with with Professor Heisel. Like what does that what does that mean for your learning outcomes and, and your well? Um, it gives me different perspectives. Um, the, sh the sharing, reading the article and then annotating, I can read um, all of my classmates' responses and replies to the article. Mm -hmm. uh, just experiences, personal, vicarious ones, and then reply to those. So it's like a discussion board right there along with the article. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so, kind of like a, a like a reading group, so that you can respond. Yes. And it sounds and and what I what I'm hearing you say is like the uh, 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 people will remark and comment in a variety of different ways. So it won't always be. It sounds uh, like it's not always the same kind of thing. They'll share their own experiences. They'll share their questions and. Uh, like, how does that help? So what we what we do is, um, as you're reading the article, you can highlight an area of the article that you would like to reply to or expand on. And so when you highlight it, there's an area for your note or annotation. And then you type that in. And then your classmates can read that and reply to it. I don't know. It just opens up, like I said, a one-stop shop there where everything's right there uh, very efficient. Um, I can uh, communicate with my classmates by just typing in and replying. They can communicate with me. Um, it just works. Mm -hmm. It works. I like. I do. I like it a lot. I, mm -hmm. I didn't know that I would, but I do. That's great. So, uh, Lee, I'm wondering if you could comment on how the that changes. Um, 
your approach to courses? Like, how does it, you, you commented how it made your, uh, mm -hmm. it saved, did just the JSTOR integration saved you time, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether having this uh, annotation, uh, social annotation, whether it changes the quality of your classes, your, le your discussions when you get mm -hmm. together, what that, what that does. Sure, I've been teaching online for a very long time. Um, and so I have seen the, the uh, landscape change. And um, so I, in an on-campus class, we always have those students who hide in the back and, and don't participate <laughs> and, and um, just kind of blend in. And in the online um, classroom, it's, it's much different. It, it really gives those students an opportunity to step out and participate. They can't hide in the background. But at the same time, there's a comfort level. There is a reduced anxiety that mm -hmm. occurs from not being necessarily on the stage of yeah. in front of your peers. And so what I found is that it actually, those students who tend to be quiet will step forward and be much more active in their learning. And, um, and that is so rewarding to see that. Um, the semester in particular with having the mix with the undergraduate and the graduate students, um, the conversations have just blossomed. Um, and there, there is a back and forth students. It's not a login, make your recording or your uh, comment and then leave. Mm -hmm. the, the students come back and come back and come back um, throughout the week and carry on mm -hmm. conversations. Um, and it's wonderful because they are, as Dana said, incorporating those experiences that they've had with what mm -hmm. they're reading and providing those, those examples. And so it really... I mean, as a um, as a student in communication, we have to be aware of those. There's there's anxieties. Uh, we there there are things that we need mm -hmm. to be aware of that our students are going through in the disability community that we may not be aware of. And Hypothesis does a wonderful service um, to level out that play for all students. Um, by by really helping to reduce that anxiety level. So it sounds like hypothesis both. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it sounds like it. Um, uh, it's it, it's extra valuable in this specific mm -hmm. course because it's it's almost reinforcing the some of the fundamental messages that you're 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 trying to yes. convey in, in the course. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm an introvert, <laughs> believe it or not, I, I am an introvert and I feel um, comfortable mm -hmm. replying, responding, interacting mm -hmm. with my classmates using hypothesis. And, and as opposed to in other environments where um, you like mm -hmm. courses, so the, like the, dis the, that. the discussion boards, uh, that's what I was used to. I was used yeah. to yeah. Uh, reading my textbook or signing mm -hmm. uh, out, reading an article, and then having to go back into a different platform mm -hmm. to actually post. And so yeah. with hypotheses, it's all there. It's just right mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. in one on one page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it also, I mean, your, your comment about being an introvert, it changed, I mean, it reminds me of classes back in, back when I would be, there would always be the, you know, the three students who would answer every question mm -hmm. because they're the ones who were comfortable getting up there and want to do it. And um, whereas the person who really knows is back there and not mm -hmm. saying anything. So it sounds like there's some opportunity for, to hear from everybody. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there it is. I'd like to hear a little bit more, um, pivot a bit and hear a little bit more about the challenges around uh, scholarly material specifically, like this is a really interesting class that mm -hmm. combines undergraduate and graduate mm -hmm. uh, students and, you know, JSTOR's ma the material on JSTOR, some of it is really dense um, mm -hmm. and way over my head and uh, really hard to get into. And that's part of what you're, you're trying to do. So Dana, maybe I'm wondering if you could mm -hmm. talk about some of the challenges you've faced or you've seen in when encountering as you've become more and more familiar with scholarly materials as you've done on your academic journey and what you, what strategies you've picked up to, to deal with that reading and to, to, to mm -hmm. make sense of it. Yeah, I mean, they, they are challenging, can be uh, extremely challenging. Uh, but what I usually do with my articles is I um, 
I do like a survey of the article. I just kind of quickly look through it and I scroll through. As uh -huh. you know, the pages, I mean, it could be 20 plus pages easily. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then after I've done my scroll through, I read the abstract. I go through, I read that, mm -hmm. and then I scroll down to the discussion and findings area of the article just to see what mm -hmm. research has rendered. And then from there, I go back to the top and I begin to read and highlight. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's my strategy right there. But I've over yeah. the years, I've been doing it so much though. I've been writing so many annotated bibliographies mm -hmm. that I've gotten used, I've gotten used to it. Mm -hmm. Sure. D did you have to learn? Did somebody teach you those steps at some point? Well, Was that part a, of my background what? is academic um, support. I used to train uh, tutors and peer leaders. And so okay. we had a lot of collaborative learning strategies that were used um, and different methods and so that that was one of them that I, I acquired and that I, I continue to use today and uh, yeah, very and, helpful. Yeah. And and it, did you do you then now share those methods? I, I mean, Lee talked about graduate students mentoring the <laughs> undergrads. Have you shared those methods, those methods? Um, some, yeah, some we we do have um, accountability groups mm -hmm. in, in the class where uh, three or four of us meet and we can talk about our challenges and hopes, dreams and whatever we want to discuss. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we I, I have mentioned that that was the strategy that I, I use mm -hmm. and, and others. Uh, that sounds great. Lee, I'm interested in your perspective as a as a d teacher, like what what supports do you, what additional supports do you think uh, are useful? What have you done? What do you what do you provide your students? Well, um, I I am a firm believer in um, the partnership of students working together. Um, everyone is coming from a, a different perspective, but also a different place in their education. And so um, when students are able to work with other students and they can they can put that what 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 they're how they're learning and then work with other students in that same way. Um, I think it just builds. It really creates um, uh, an opportunity for the students to learn side by side and build on each other's. So whenever experiences, so whenever a, a graduate student who like Dana is in the class mm -hmm. and is able to navigate um, an article that an undergraduate student who is working alongside of her, who isn't yet a graduate student, all right, um, can see, okay, well, she is navigating it, so I can navigate it too, all right, and reaches out and says, how, how did you figure this out? Or, you know, what did this mean? And the graduate student is right there to help help with that. Um, yeah. I think it's just wonderful. It's, it's, that, it's that network of support um, that is so, it's such a rich experience, um, for students to, to gain while they're mm -hmm. in school. Um, and I really, I really enjoy seeing that develop. And so with hypothesis and having the students literally working on in the textbook together, I mean, our textbook being articles, but mm -hmm. working on that together, everyone is writing their notes literally in the yes. margins. Yes. I mean, with their comments. So if a student is confused on something and, a, and an undergraduate student is confused and a graduate student has commented on that part that they're confused about, they're learning. They're, they're gaining s some additional um, skills there by interpreting what it is that they were struggling with through the graduate student's mm -hmm. perspective, and it helps. And so that it's just a very, very rewarding experience. It is. Yeah. That sounds great. Like I, I remember, you know, doing the reading clubs back when, when uh, in the dark ages when I was in school, mm -hmm. and just the value of being with another student grappling with something, mm -hmm. and 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 just being able to say, "I don't get this." Yes. Um. There, even that is a contribution because others can weigh in and help, and you can work exactly. on it together, uh, and that's really meaningful. Mm -hmm. And um, shoot, there was something else I was going to say. Um. Uh, the, I don't get it, or the other 
thing that tends to happen as people are originally getting into this material is not just I don't get it, but I disagree with this. Or yes. I'm really mm-hmm. fight, mm-hmm. fighting with this idea. Yes. Um, and being able mm-hmm. to grapple with that in a scholarly way as opposed yes. to an emotional one uh, mm-hmm. is a really big change in how right. people develop information literacy skills. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, and also, Alex, the um, not sometimes agreeing with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, where yeah. it's, a, it's a community and you you have to respect the perspectives and opinions and viewpoints of your classmates and how to do that in a way that is respectful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, That's an amazing. I... Learn that as well. If they've never experienced it before, they will learn that here using hypothesis in this format. Mm-hmm. That, that sounds like a useful skill for democracy, mm-hmm. yes. not just in life. <laughs> uh, I, I, just an aside, I mean, so one of the things that uh, the, our innovation team does is a lot of work with providing JSTOR inside of uh, carceral settings, so making oh, yeah. it available mm-hmm. uh, in, in prisons. And I've, ha- I've heard a lot of incarcerated students say the same uh, say the same thing of we're learning how to disagree in a way that is a very different than what we, we've been taught to do and it's mm-hmm. uh, it's incredible and impactful mm-hmm. uh, it's a skill we all need more of in this we society do. we do <laughs> yes yes and hypothesis certainly encourages those conversations to occur uh, well that sounds wonderful I think we're, we're coming up on our end the mm-hmm. end of our time together I want to give you uh, a few ch- thoughts for final, uh, any final words? If there's any final questions out there in the audience, um, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, otherwise we can begin to bring this to a to a close. Mm-hmm. Well, I found the experience to be very rewarding. And um, I, I, I just so thoroughly enjoy the students' conversations. Um, there are classes that I've taught um, in person and where it's just, it's really pulling teeth to get some participation. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to wonder, are, are there questions? Are they just not asking? Are they, uh, has, are they hesitating for a reason? What is it? But in with yeah. using hypothesis, it's much, much different. And so, um, I've actually started incorporating hypothesis into my on-campus classes as well. Mm-hmm so that the students who aren't necessarily speaking up in class because of anxiety or or any kind of yes. um, concern they have that opportunity to annotate um the items that we're talking about in class uh, whether it be a you know a video of or um an article or an either textbook whatever um so that so that i'm hearing their voices too and their classmates can see them uh, that's that sounds amazing. So, Dana, do you will you be advocating for hypo- to other teachers to use hypothesis? Ooh, I, I will. Yeah, definitely. So helpful. Good. Good luck with <laughs> good luck with that. Because I do think it. Every teacher I talk to that that uses it, um, so that changes the nature of the classroom. They 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 show up no longer like they know the students have read read it. Yes. And they know where they're having trouble, and that just yeah. changes the dynamic. And then you get the value of the conversations like you've yeah. been talking about. It's really, uh, really great to see. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, Lee and Dana, thank you so much. Uh, Dana, best of luck on your career trajectory. Thank you. And, I appreciate uh, that. Thank you. Uh, Lee, thank you so much for, for being here. And if my anybody pleasure. has any questions, my contact information is in the slide deck. Please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.